Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Andrew Jackson, Part 1. Andrew Jackson was the seventh president of the United States of America. He was elected U.S. president in 1832, in 1828, and re-elected in 1832. <clears throat> and he, so he served two terms from 1829 to 1837. And uh, he's a, he should, probably sh should have been elected in 1824. He received the most votes but did not win when the decision was sent to the House of Representatives. Andrew Jackson was orphaned at age 14. His parents were immigrants from Ireland, and he had a childhood of death, war, and hardship. Very tough childhood. <clears throat> his parents arrived in the United States two years before his birth. He dissipated a small inheritance as a wild teenager. Jackson fought countless duels and won and lost thousands of dollars on horse races. He was very beloved by the common people because he, uh, in fact, he was the first president really to come from very, very humble origins, come, coming from, from very little. Uh, he, and so he, he inspired the common man in the United States, and he, his, uh, he promoted equality of opportunity. He was the first president born in a log cabin, uh, and he's, he's, he became really famous for the Battle of New Orleans in January of 1815, part of the, uh, well, the end of the uh, War of 1812 with Great Britain. Uh, the country was uh, in a hard, went through hard times after, it, when the British had burned, had, had walked, basically invaded Washington easily, set the White House on fire, set the Capitol on fire and other buildings. The country was very demoralized, and um, there was talk of secession in New England. And uh, <clears throat> if the British had taken New Orleans, they could have kept it. And so anyway, his victory against the British in, um, in New Orleans really uh, inspired the country, and, and the morale of the country was lifted, ending talk of secession in New England, and also... Uh, Stopping the British from taking New Orleans, which controls the uh, the mouth of the Mississippi River, and of course the Mississippi River system drains most of the United States. He also uh, was famous for uh, his victory against American Indians at Horseshoe Bend, Alabama, and also in, in uh, against Seminole Indians in Florida. He's uh, a controversial president uh, during his time uh, and today. Uh, he, he's, he helped stop the secession of South Carolina as president. And there's been talk, there was talk in recent years of removing his, uh, his image from the $20 bill, primarily because of his actions regarding American Indians. He fought American Indians in battle in Alabama and Florida, and he also uh, and he was, he negotiated treaties in which uh, much of their land was lost. And he sponsored, promoted the Indian Removal Act, which moved American Indians from the southeast to what's now Oklahoma. And, of course, there's the, part of that was the famous Trail of Tears in which so many uh, Cherokee Indians died. So he's, he has his defenders and supporters. Uh, he was the inspiration for Abraham Lincoln when, he, when Lincoln faced secession from the south, the same issue. And Jackson had stood up to South Carolina and stop that from happening. Uh, Harry Truman, who was president in the 20th century, ranked Jackson among his top four all time, along with George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. Andrew Jackson liked well-cut clothes, racehorses, dueling, newspapers, gambling, whiskey, coffee, a pipe, pretty women, children, and good company. He was born on March 15, 1767, in Waxhaw, South Carolina, very near the North Carolina border. There's been uh, or, uh, confusion whether he was in which state he was born, but scholars believe it was in South Carolina. He's born in a log cabin. He did not receive much education. He was the third uh, son in his family, the third of three children, all sons. His father died weeks before his birth. His father was uh, working hard, clearing land, and got sick and died. So that was tragic. He never knew his father. Very tragic. 
His parents' names were Andrew and Elizabeth Jackson. Now, after his father's death, uh, his mother, who had these three little young boys, she ended up moving in with her sister, and she worked helping her sister take care of, of, of her sister's eight children. So that's where uh, Jackson grew up, in his aunt's house. It was a childhood of humiliating dependence growing up in his aunt's home. His mother was a very good woman, hardworking, and a very good uh, Christian. And every Sunday they'd go to the Presbyterian church for, f- spend four hours in church on Sunday. And that made an impression on him. Growing up, he had a lot of energy. He was a fun-loving young fellow, and he was, he was a fighter. He had gotten a lot of, th- throughout his life. Andrew Jackson was a fighter. He, Partly, he had no father. I think that was a very tough thing. And so he had a temper, definitely had a temper. He got into fights his whole life. Um, by age nine, summer, summer of age nine, seven, was 17, the year was 1776, and uh, the Declaration of Independence reached Waxhaw, South Carolina. And many of the local adults were illiterate, and Jack, uh, Jackson, as a nine-year-old boy, led, read the Declaration out loud to a group of adults who could not read. He learned to read by the age of five. He was a very bright, very smart fellow. He attended a small country school in Waxhaw, South Carolina. By uh, 1779, the American Revolution was ongoing, and his older brother, Hugh, had enlisted in the South Carolina militia, and he died at the, as a result of heat and fatigue following the Battle of Stono Ferry, southwest of Charleston. So he lost his, his one sibling, his older brother, the oldest brother, Hugh, in 1779. The following year, Jackson himself enlisted in the South Carolina militia to serve in the Revolutionary War. He was only 13 years old, just a young fellow, very young. The following year, he was captured along with his brother by the British when Jackson was 14. And there was the famous incident where a British officer ordered him to shine his boots. And uh, Jackson refused. He was a strong-willed uh, guy. And in, in response, the British officer struck him with his saber and hit him on his arm and head. And he carried scars for the rest of his life. Now, during that time, his brother, his other brother, Robert, got sick. Eventually, his mother came and was able to get the two boys released, but his brother died in the spring of 1781. Then his mother went off to, uh, nurse, uh, to help to care for her, uh, her, these children of, his, uh, of, of the aunt, of, of her sister, and she died of cholera in November. Jackson got word that his mother had died, and he never found out where she was buried. So 14 years of age, his, his father, he had never known his father, and his two siblings, two brothers died, and his mother died. And so this really, now he had an Irish back, background. Of course, the Irish are, were persecuted by the English for centuries, and Jackson had a, well, he had a lifelong hatred of the British, in large part because of, the, uh, because of what happened, losing his uh, mother and brothers during the American Revolution against the British. So that was tough. He was 14 years old and all alone in the world. 1783, uh, a four, he had a, a wealthy uh, or a grandfather who had some money who died in Ireland, and he received four, a 400-pound inheritance, which he quickly squandered on clothes, horse races, dice, and, the, and a gay life, and having a good time in the taverns in Charleston, South Carolina. So that money was gone. He, easy come, easy go. By seven, that same year, 1783, the American Revolution ended. Peace with Great Britain. The 13 North American colonies had become independent of Great Britain. They won the war. George Washington and the Continental Army won the war, although they still really were not united in the United States uh, by the Constitution, which would happen in four years. However, um, the British continued to supply American Indians with guns and ammunition from Detroit and their forts in northwestern Ohio, and paid the Indians for every American scalp they brought in. So there was uh, peace, but there sort of a the war, in a sense, was ongoing. The British uh, supporting Indians, fighting Americans. Now during his life, people liked to uh, say, "Oh, Jackson was a very ignorant guy," but. 
The thing is, he uh, he mispronounced words, and he's, his spelling wasn't very good, but he, he was actually a lot more educated than people believed. He could quote Shakespeare, Plutarch, and Alexander Pope, and he read more than his critics believed. He went, as I said, growing up, these church services impressed him four hours in, in church on Sunday growing up. As an adult, he read three chapters of the Bible every day. And in his library as an adult, he had biographies of famous people, including Napoleon Bonaparte, George Washington, and William Wallace, <coughs> the uh, Scottish patriot. Jackson said, quote, I have always thought that Sir William Wallace, as a virtuous patriot and warrior, was the best model of a young man. In him we find a stubborn virtue, the truly undaunted courage, always ready to brave any dangers for the re relief of his country or his friend. Of course, the uh, famous movie Braveheart was made about William Wallace, and the actor was Mel Gibson. And that would appeal to Jackson, since... Uh, since uh, Walt William Wallace was uh, leading Scottish forces fighting the English, and the and Jackson was really hated the English because of wh what had happened in the war. By 1784, he moved to Salisbury, North Carolina, and studied to be a lawyer. He was a wild young man. He was called quote the most roaring, rollicking, game cocking, card playing, mischievous fellow that ever lived in Salisbury. He spoke with an Irish brogue, of course. <coughs> His parents were Irish immigrants, so that's natural. He enjoyed horse racing, lifelong, and dice gambling, taverns, gambling, and, and cockfights. One of his uh, fine biographers, John Meacham, wrote, quote, Andrew Jackson possessed charm that made other men like him and want to join him in exploits that crossed the line of respectability, but never so dramatically that they could not stumble back into the good graces of their wives and neighbors by the next morning. His ability to lead was already evident in North Carolina. By 1787, he had been admitted to the North Carolina Bar to practice law as a lawyer. The following year, 1788, in October, he moved to Nashville, Tennessee. And, you know, Tennessee really became his home for the rest of his life and the state with, with which he is most closely associated. And he began his legal career. He traveled, with a, uh, he traveled on the New Cumberland Road with a party of settlers who were all traveling together for safety reasons. However, during the trip, several were killed by Indians on the trip to Tennessee. And Tennessee had, uh, during this time, was still, there was ongoing war between settlers and American Indians. From, se from 1782 to 1789, 1,500 Americans were killed and scalped on the Ohio River in the, again, the ongoing war. And as the settlers were moving in, the Indians were, they were fighters. They were fighting each other, and they fought American settlers. By 1791, Jackson married Rachel Robards, who was in August of that year. She was the love of his life. They had a wonderful marriage. They really loved each other, and uh, she was a very good woman. Uh, the so and, and the thing is, Jackson was alone in the world. He'd lost his family, and you know, so she, he started a family with her, and she was. They, they got along so well, and very good friends. Wonderful marriage. Uh, the complication they had is that this was her second um, marriage. In fact, when she met Jackson, she was uh, uh, she, she was still married, and she had a very troubled first marriage. Her 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 first husband, and then uh, she Rachel smoked a pipe. Uh, so anyway, they got married in 1791. It turns out that her marriage they they she thought she was divorced. There was confusion about that, but it turns out apparently the the divorce hadn't gone through. So they remarried in 1794 because the first marriage was invalid. And then his political enemies used this against him that, oh, he got this woman's, uh, this woman's wife, uh, or got this woman from another man, and, and his wife was a bad woman. They used this uh, politic, and they were living together outside of matrimony, which apparently was true, but not because they, they didn't know. Uh, so anyway, that was... He had a lot of, since he was a fighter, he had gotten into a lot of fights with guys who liked to insult him regarding his wife, whom, with whom he was very uh, protective of and who, who really, with, and, and he really loved her. They had no children of their own. Uh, however, uh, they weren't able to have children, but they did adopt children. 
They adopted three sons. There's a story that uh, after Rachel joined the Presbyterian Church, uh, she would ask uh, Jackson to bless the food before each meal. And in the story, one day at their home at the Hermitage uh, near Nashville, Tennessee, their famous home, they had a number of guests since Jackson was telling a story of battle. Of course, he was a, he was a warrior. He'd been in battle against Indians and against the British, and against the Indians in Alabama and Florida. And in the story, uh, he was using expletives. Anyway, Rachel asked him to bless the food, and Jackson did, and then continued the story in the same tone with the same language. As I said, they did not have their own children. They adopt, In 1804, they adopted Rachel's nephew, Andrew Donaldson, at age five. And, and four years later, they adopted another of her nephews uh, from her, uh, of her, another nephew whom they named Andrew Jackson, Jr., and then in 1813, they adopted a Creek Indian whose uh, parents had been killed in war. Named and the boy, the, This baby was named Lincoya. Uh, this was back after the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. There was this baby, and Jackson told these Indian women to... F- it was baby was crying, and they said... Uh, he told these Indian women to, uh, you know, take care of the child. They said, no, we're not going to do it. The, he said that... Of course, they were demoralized, and they said, oh, his family's, oh, they're all dead, so you might as well kill the baby, too. And Jackson wouldn't do that, so he adopted this boy, this baby boy, Creek Indian, Lincoya. 1791, he was, uh, again, he's practicing law on the circuit, circuit meaning traveling, and the traveling court all, all over North Carolina, and there were these Indian attacks when they would travel from town to town as the, as the, court, tra- uh, as the court traveled. <coughs> in uh, March of 1791, he had a close call and uh, fighting Indians while traveling, doing his legal work. And Jackson said, quote, When danger rears its head, I can never shrink from it. November of 1791 was the, again, it was the worst disaster, or it was a major disaster for the U.S. military. Uh, General Arthur St. Clair and the U.S. Army uh, was uh, there was fighting in in northwestern Ohio, and 39 of 52 officers were killed. 593 of 863 soldiers were killed. 200 camp followers were killed, and six, only six. So this is a major Indian victory. I believe mean, fallen timbers in northwestern Ohio, and this Indian victory led to more Indian attacks on the Ohio River. The ongoing Indian wars. By 1795, (coughs) excuse me, there were enough people in uh, Tennessee to try to become a state. So uh, Jackson was a member of the Tennessee State Constitutional Convention, writing a constitution for possible admission as a state in a new state. The following year, the following year, Tennessee was admitted as to the Union as the 16th state in the United States. And Jackson was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Jackson uh, had was uh, played a, fo- a role in in having in the, the name of this new state. He promoted the Cherokee word, uh, which was uh, the Cherokee word Tennessee, which me- which meant Great Crooked River, and this was adopted. It was the major river in the state. And Jackson said about that word, quote, It has a flavor on the tongue as sweet as hot corn cakes and honey. Jackson was U.S. in the U.S. Representative, U.S. House of Representatives from 1796 to 1797. Tra- tra- that meant travel to Washington City, later renamed Washington, D.C. Um, by 97, he'd been elected to the U.S. Senate from Tennessee. However, after only... At three months in the House, and then he was three months in the Senate, he quit after uh, uh, he was impatient with uh, p- political life in Washington. He was a man of action, still, you know, a young man, and he missed his wife, Rachel. So he went, he went home to Nashville, Tennessee. 1798 to 1804, Jackson was a judge in the Tennessee Superior Court. So he had income from that. By 1802, he'd been named a major general in the Tennessee Militia. So he was at this uh, military bent. As judge, and he was a fighter, he got into, he attacked the Tennessee, Tennessee governor, John Sevier, for a slurring remark. 
a derogatory remark regarding his wife Rachel. They people knew that they they could really uh, antagonize him, and they like people like to talk, and they would say things against uh, Rachel. They almost had a duel between the governor of Tennessee and uh, a judge on the, the state's state supreme court, and the confrontation took place in Knoxville. And uh, Sevier reportedly said, quote, I know of no great service you rendered this country except taking a trip to Natchez with another man's wife, referring to the time when uh, yeah, Jackson knew that Rachel was being abused by her husband, was trying to help her. And so anyway, Jackson was offended. He said, great God, do you mention her sacred name? By 1804, uh, Andrew and Rachel bought a farm near Nashville, Tennessee, which they named the Hermitage and became their famous home and very beloved home. He borrowed money and uh, bought a racehorse named Truxton and won $6,500 on a horse race bet. And then he bought another horse called Greyhound. Jackson did well in uh, raising horses and then making money from horse races. He had a, a sizable income from that. 1805, Aaron Burr visited the famous Aaron Burr, who had been vice president. Burr was kind of a character, and uh, he was planning to create his own empire in the Southwest. Seize New Orleans, and seize New Orleans. So this was treason. And Jackson wrote a letter to Pres President Jefferson about, about this, and later Aaron Burr was arrested. Aaron Burr. 1806, there was uh, more talk about Rachel, that she was this uh, bad woman, things like that. And uh, Jackson got involved in a duel in which Nashville attorney Charles Dickinson was killed. In fact, or at the beginning of the duel, Jackson just waited, let, let uh, Dickinson shoot him. And Jackson took a bullet in the chest, which stayed in his chest for life. And then he calmly shot uh, Dickinson dead. And... Uh, Dickinson had called Jackson, quote, a worthless scoundrel, a poltroon, and a coward. So Jackson had killed this man in a duel in 1806, Charles Dickinson. By 1808, uh, Jackson and they adopted uh, Jackson, Andrew and Rachel. They, were, they gave up on trying to have their own kids. They were four, Rachel was 41, and they adopted uh, um, Rachel's... Uh, Brother Severn, his wife had a baby, and they adopted one of the two twins, and they named him Andrew Jackson Jr. During this time, Jackson was continuing to travel by wagon, you know, travel the state for the, as the court would move from town to town. And in 1809, he was traveling by wagon from Nashville to Knoxville. He was stopped by two burly wagoners who were uh, who were drunk and crazy and. Uh, they told him to dance. They said, uh, and uh, it was a bad situation. And of course, he wasn't going to. He acted scared and said he couldn't dance without his slippers, which were in his trunk. So they said, all right, go get your uh, slippers so you can dance. So he went and instead he got pistols. And he came out with these pistols uh, trained on these two fellows. And he said, quote, now you infernal villains, you shall dance for me. Dance, dance. And they did. Another anecdote about him. By 1812, the U.S. was at war again with Great Britain. And, of course, Jackson had this major resentment against the British. He was a major general in the War of 1812. During the war, he got his nickname, Old Hickory, because uh, he was tough, ramrod straight, and immovable like an iron-hard hickory tree. Apparently, hick the wood of a hickory tree is very hard. Jackson had that combination. He was a very effective military leader because he was very brave, but he cared about his soldiers. He could discipline them. He could actually execute men if there was th things were getting out of control in terms of mutiny. But he also was very beloved because they, they, they soldiers knew he cared about them. He was brave and kind, very beloved by the men he commanded. H.W. Brands, another biographer of Jackson, wrote, quote, <clears throat> To Jackson and most Westerners, the Indian threat lay at the heart of the reason for the War of 1812. Tecumseh had accomplished something no Indian since Pontiac had achieved, an alliance of several tribes against the whites. 
Memories of Pontiac's War, of the terror unleashed against men, women, and children, of refugees fleeing farms and villages for their lives, remained an active part of the Western consciousness. So the a big part of uh, Jackson's life or the controversy about him is uh, deals with his relations with American Indians. And, of course, the Indians, uh, they had all their... St- They'd been fighting each other, the Indian nations, with their own self-interest, trying to expand their land. And then, when, of course, the, when the Europeans came and European Americans, uh, the Indians really lost everything. They were, they were pushed away and they were defeated. Uh, there's a, uh, an irrelevant uh, passage from the book, The Heart of Everything That Is, The Untold Story of Red Cloud, an American Legend by Bob Drury and Tom Clavin, 2013. Page 50, there's a quote from the book. As the tale goes, one evening Red Cloud, he was an American Indian leader, attended a White House reception given by President Ulysses S. Grant and found himself in conversation with a bitter officer who had been fighting Indians. Trying to explain the mystical hold that Paha Sapa had, Paha Sapa is the land where where he lived, The mystical hold that Paha Sapa had on his people, he told the officer, My ancestors' bones lie in the Black Hills. And then the officer replied, Horse shit. Nonsense. Your people have been there no more than two generations. They come from Minnesota, and you were born in Nebraska. You took that land from the Crow Indians. And do you know why you took that land from the Crows? Because you could. And do you know why we will take that land from you? Because we can. 1813, uh, during the War of 1812, Jackson said, quote, Every man of the western country turns his eyes intuitively upon the mouth of the Mississippi River. At the approach of an enemy in that quarter, the whole western world should pour forth its sons to meet the invader and drive him back into the sea. Yeah, there was talk that the British... (coughs) New Orleans was the most important, was an extremely important city because if, if you could control New Orleans, <coughs> you controlled the, uh, the outlet of the Mississippi River system. And Western farmers relied on the Mississippi to get their, uh, to get their crops to market because they would get, thing, they'd get their produce to the Mississippi River system and then it would have to go down out to, to past New Orleans and then over to the East Coast. So there was talk that the British were going to t- attack New Orleans in 1813. In the spring, uh, Jackson was leading the, the Tennessee militia, 2,000 men, and they marched south toward uh, New Orleans to face this tr- threat. When they arrived in Natchez, Mississippi, Jackson received an order that he should dismiss, uh, this, uh, dismiss the Corps, these, these fellows. And he thought, well, I can't just leave these guys here. Those actually were his orders, just to dis, just to dismiss these fellows. But he was a responsible man. He thought, this is terrible. I can't do this. So he, he marched the men 600 miles back to, to Nashville. He refused to leave them. He got supplies on personal credit. And respect for Andrew Jackson grew among his men. They realized, wow, look at what he's doing for us. So this was really something. Jack and, and So Jackson said at this time, when he was in Natchez, Mississippi, quote, those that that could escape from the insalubrious climate are to be deprived of the necessary support and meet death by famine. The remaining few to be deprived of their arms pass through the savage land where our women and children and defenseless citizens are daily murdered. Yet through that barbarous climb, our band of citizens and soldiers wander and fall a sacrifice to the tomahawk and scalping knife of the wilderness." Our sick left naked in the open field and remain without supplies, without nourishment, or an earthly comfort. As long as I have friends, I will stick by them. So he thought, this is, I can't do this. He, he was determined to get the men back to Nashville. And he, you know, they took the river, Mississippi going to s- south, but they had to march north. He used his personal credit to get supplies for that trip. He was hoping to be reimbursed by the government, and this meant he faced possible bankruptcy. And this is when he got his nickname, Old Hickory. The men loved him for what he did. He did not abandon them, and they all arrived safe in Nashville. 
After arriving, <coughs> the Nashville Whig newspaper wrote, quote, <coughs> Long will the general live in the memory of the volunteers of West Tennessee for his benevolent, humane, and fatherly treatment to his soldiers. If gratitude and love can reward him, General Jackson has them. And during that same year, he got involved with a very unfortunate, uh, another feud uh, with uh, two brothers, Jesse Benton and Thomas Hart Benton. And they had a gun battle in Nashville right on the street. Right on the streets, and Jackson almost died here. He was shot many times. Again, he had bullets in his body. His arm was shattered, and the doctors wanted to amputate. He said no. He carried these bullets for 19 years before they were removed. Interestingly, later he became friends with Thomas Hart Benton when both were in the Senate. Benton said, quote, After a deadly feud, I became his confidential advisor was offered the highest mark of his favor and received from his dying bed a message of friendship dictated when life was departing and when he would have to pause and when he would have to pause for breath again during this time uh, the uh, uh, the in, yeah, this was the era of Tecumseh when he uh, was organized the Shawnee Indian who was organizing American Indians to try to stop the expansion of European Americans westward, which was depriving Indians of their land. And Tecumseh was going around trying to inspire these Indian nations, which had the challenges, they'd, they'd been fighting each other. So there was, there were strong hatreds among the different, between the nations. It's hard to get them to, together to fight the uh, European Amer descent Americans. Tecumseh said during this time, quote, "'A cursed be the race that has seized our country, Back, whence they came, upon a trail of blood, they must be driven. Back, back, I into the great water. He's talking about the Atlantic Ocean. Whose accursed waves brought them to our shores. Burn their dwellings, destroy their stock, slay their wives and children. The red man owns the country. War now, war forever. War upon the living, war upon the dead. Dig their very corpses from the grave. Our country must give no rest to a white man's bones. Well, that concludes today's presentation. We'll continue next time with part two uh, of Andrew Jackson's very interesting life. Uh, I hope you find a good history book to read. You might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. You also might consider checking out our podcast, Adventures in History, available on Spotify, Breakers, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.